Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and that is our Kenmore dishwasher going in the background <laughs> that we decided we weren't going to turn off. <laughs> so It was almost done, so we decided to let it finish the cycle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I want you to know, ladies, <laughs> that I loaded that dishwasher this morning. Yes, he did. He's quite handy around the house, women. <laughs> He's a mighty man of God. Ever since my mother passed away, I've always enjoyed, that was 2000, I've always enjoyed doing housework. I did it before, but I truly, when I do housework, I feel my mother's spirit. I don't mean her ghost. I'm not getting weird on you, <laughs> but I just sense my mother's presence when I do housework and Therefore, it's just a delight to do that. Sometimes she has to come out and slap my hands. I'll say, say, would you please leave my chores for me, leave dear? Leave chores for Kitty to do. Of course, I don't do them. Because I love it, too. I don't. It's not very often. don't often do them the way a, a lady's hand will, will do them. <laughs> I don't have the eye for that level of detail all the time, but I try. And uh, He's very helpful. <laughs> very helpful. And today, in the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, we are in Isaiah chapter 36. Isaiah chapter 36. Father, we thank you for the study of your word. We glorify you, Lord. We draw to your word. We draw near to you. When we take your word in our lips, we bring Jesus on the scene because you said in John 1, that Jesus is the word made flesh. Yes, God. And so let your word become flesh in our study today. Let your Holy Spirit come. We just acknowledge you. We connect with you. We acknowledge those that are gathered with us around the world, Father God. And we say yes, yes to your spirit. Yes to this body. We may not be in a brick and mortar church, but we are a body gathered nonetheless. And we say, And we just pray out your mysteries. Mysteries in Siberian Russia. Mysteries in Beijing. Mysteries in the United Arab Emirates. Mysteries in Nashville, Tennessee. In Port Allen, Louisiana. And in Branson, Missouri. Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. And Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> and we just thank you, Father, Glory. for that which is represented in this Bible study, Father. Thank you, Father. And we glorify you today. Yes. We're thankful to be able to do this. Lord, we know you spoil us, but the difference is we, we don't take it for granted. We appreciate it. Father. We appreciate it. And so Isaiah... 36, who do you think you are? <laughs> In chapter 36 of Isaiah, the emissaries of Assyria come up against the besieged city of Jerusalem to mock their faith in God. Hezekiah is ill, the city is surrounded, and there is no deliverance coming out of Egypt or Ethiopia. Rabshakeh of Assyria taunts the faith that the people have in God and he points to the destruction of other nations around them and he says, who do you think you are? As a taunt that the enemy brings against them and doesn't he do the same against us? When you dare to put your trust in God, there will be times and circumstances that people, remember Job's wife and her thinking when she told Job just curse God and die when Jesus was hanging on the cross. The Pharisees said he saved others himself. He cannot save. Mm -hmm. uh, how many times has it been said, where's your God now? What you do next, what you do in the midst of that. What did Jesus do when he was mocked? He said, Father, forgive them knuckleheads. <laughs> Those rascals. Father, forgive them for they know not <laughs> what, what they, they do. do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people... If they realized what they were doing, if they realized that they were aligning themselves with the accuser, if they realized that they were aligning themselves with the darkest demonic force in creation, they wouldn't say the things they do. When they sneer, when they roll their eyes, when they 
whisper behind our back because we choose to believe God in impossible situations. What you do next when that comes determines whether deliverance comes or whether you're going to be plowed under by the assault of the enemy. So Isaiah 36, verses 1 through 9, please. Okay. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh. Boom shakalaka. Rabshakeh. <laughs> we were pronouncing all these names We were before. trying. Um, okay. Uh, from Lace, Lace, Lake Lake Ish, Ish. to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him El Elikim, Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, and Shibna the scribe, and Joah, and Asaph's son, the recorder. And Rabshakeh Boom <laughs> said unto them, <laughs> Say ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is there with wherewith thou trusteth? I say, sayest thou, but they are but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? So what's happening is the emissary of the king of Assyria, who is a representative of a nation the king Sennacherib's already defeated, is now being a spokesman to Jerusalem, and he's standing out there mocking them, saying, hey, he whooped me. He's going to whoop you too. Don't deceive yourself into thinking you can put your trust in God. That's what the man's doing. Verse 6. Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all that trust in him. But if thou say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high place and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away, and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar? Now, therefore, give pledges, I pray thee, to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give thee two thousand horses, if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants, and put there thy trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? So, in other words, what he's saying is, uh, give me a down payment, I will loan you the horses, because you don't have the strength with 2,000 horsemen to go up against the very least of the captains of my master's army. Do you see how he's uh, mocking them, how he's uh, deriding them? And he's saying that, how is it that you're putting your trust in God? Has not Hezekiah taken down all the high places in the groves where you worship this God? And he's commanded you to worship in this one place in the city of Jerusalem. What Hezekiah did is he took down the altars of the idols in the high places and said, you're going to come here and worship in the temple. But from watching Judah and the southern kingdom, the Assyrians and the nations around them presumed that they worshiped the Hebrew God in the high places because worship in the high places was so common among the people of God. But they weren't worshiping Jehovah in the high places. They were worshiping Chemosh and Moloch and Baal. Mercy. But from the outside looking in, they knew that they named the name of Jehovah every time they turned around, but they worshiped in the high places, so they just presumed that in the high places they were worshiping the Hebrew God because it was so much a part of their culture. Doesn't that remind you of things in Christian culture and what it looks like from the outside Looking in, it's a different perspective than how we see things. And so in chapter 36 of Isaiah, we find the beginning account of the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem. Sennacherib of Assyria has invaded Judah, and he's taken all of the defense cities, and now he finally surrounds Jerusalem itself. And in the midst of this, Isaiah realized in the previous chapters, he's prophesying the indignation of the Lord against them and the consolation of Jerusalem by a supernatural deliverance of the hand of God. 
And when the siege is set in place, Sennacherib sends a representative from a nearby nation that he's already taken captive. How many times have you had a captive tell you you aren't going to get free from your captivity? Somebody who's bound in the same circumstance that you're in <laughs> saying, who do you think you are? I didn't get free and I've got more faith and more power with God than you do. What makes you think you're going to get free? Mm -hmm. And so he sends Lachish, he sends uh, Rabshakeh uh, of Lachish uh, to, uh, who's already a captive because he has no respect for the defiance of Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is defying that which he couldn't overcome. In other words, how many times do you see people do that? You're up against something that's defeated somebody that you're looking to for material support in the midst of a challenge, and you're hoping they'll add their faith to yours. But what they really do many times is they go through this mental gymnastic assuming that you must be in presumption because they were walking in faith and got plowed under in the same circumstance and they absolutely know you don't have more faith than they do. They're not going to assume that you're more godly than they are or you, you have more faith than they do. They're just going to conclude you're just in presumption. And that's what Rabshak is saying. Why are you presuming that your God is going to uh, liberate you because our gods didn't liberate us? Who do you think you are? So the first taunt that Rabshakeh speaks against Jerusalem, it's interesting. The first taunt does not deal with their trust in God. The first taunt deals with what was more prominent that Isaiah has been dealing with the whole time we've been reading in Isaiah. What was it? Their false trust in Egypt and Ethiopia. Looking from the inside out, uh, the Assyrian army who's been studying and watching and sending spies into Judah for all this time and reporting back to Sennacherib, the first and most obvious thing they see is they're not saying how they're putting their trust in God. They're saying how they're putting their trust in Egypt and Ethiopia. So he's going to deal with that first and then talk about their confidence in God is almost like a side issue. See, this is a dark stain on the testimony of the people of God. Even though Hezekiah is now king and has instituted reforms after the brutal reign of Ahaz, there is still strong sentiment that Egypt will save them from Assyria. See, their first trust was not in God, but in the mercenary strength of the nations to the south that they had already hired by taking gold out of the temple to defend them. And the prophecy of Isaiah has been, up to this point, that the Egyptians and the Ethiopians would be humiliated by Assyria, stripped naked, and forced marched into slavery and captivity. And history tells us this literally came to pass. History outside of the sacred narrative. History tells us that this came to pass, and in addition, that 16,000 Israelites were likewise humiliated, stripped naked from the waist down, and forced marched with the Egyptians and Ethiopians that they put their trust in into Assyrian captivity. Mm -hmm. Rabshakeh, the spokesman for the king of Assyria, he knows this narrative very well, and he knows as an outsider looking in that the greatest confidence of the people, even under Hezekiah's reign, is not the promise of God, but the false hope of deliverance from the South. And so he focuses there. He's not talking about, he's not talking theology. He's talking uh, geopolitical alliances because the people have been saying a confederation, a confederation, when the spies were coming in from the Assyrian army and listening to what the Egyptians were, the, uh, the people of Judah were saying, he, the spies heard the people of Judah saying the same thing that Isaiah was complaining about. This, this people says, a confederacy, a confederacy, we need to cut a deal with the Egyptians. Yeah, it's trust in God, you can read your Bible if you want to, but man, we need to cut a deal with these Egyptians to get this problem solved. Hmm. And so when Sennacherib shows up and sends Rapshaka, what's he talking about? He deals with where their confidence primarily is, he focuses there and only as an afterthought does he go on to add that any hope of protection from the Hebrew God would be thwarted just as none of the other gods of the other nations had protected them from the might and the power of Assyria. See, Assyria is the ascendant power in the region. Mm -hmm. 
And despite Ahaz's efforts to woo the previous king, to woo the Assyrians by desecrating the temple with images of Assyrian deities, it hasn't convinced Sennacherib not to purpose to overthrow Jerusalem and take the people into captivity. See, we make compromises. Ahaz, before Hezekiah, he didn't say, oh, I'm going to shake my fist in God's face. No, he was saying, I know what we'll do. They know how we reverence the temple, so we'll take the doors off the temple and erect idols to Assyrian gods and let Assyria see that we're doing it so they'll think we're on their team and they won't be against us. But it's like the Lord told me one time. He says, the point where you're willing to compromise with the enemy is the beginning point of what they're going to demand, not the end point. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we try and think our way through a situation. We'll say, well, I'm willing to go this far to try and keep peace. But that's only the starting point of the enemy is going to take you. He's going to manacle you and he's going to drag you kicking and screaming into his territory. So you might as well just sit down and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Go ahead and do your worst, but I'm not putting up with that. <laughs> and you say, well, what does that apply to? And some of you are saying, amen, yes, amen, hallelujah. You know exactly where it's applied to. And if you haven't encountered that kind of challenge, well, you just wait and remember this counsel because it'll be helpful to you in time to come. Because sooner or later, everybody faces these challenges, whether it's in the job, on your marriage, uh, in, uh, uh, in, ch in a church situation, in some situation, you're going to have to deal with these issues. Have you ever found yourself in a difficult place, not knowing where to be, where to turn, only to be mocked by others for even hoping for deliverance? Who do you think you are? <laughs> Have you ever cried out to God for salvation in a brutal circumstance, only to have somebody like Rabshakeh come up mocking you? You know, Rabshakeh's nation was already overthrown, and he was serving as a vassal to Sennacherib, king of Syria. Sometimes there will be people around you who will have their ego wrapped up in their failure and will challenge your faith in God and say it's a false hope that you're expecting things to ever get better because they didn't get better for them. And they have a baseline assumption they're a better person than you are and know more about God than you do. And if God didn't deliver them, who do you think you are that he's going to deliver you? And they've already perverted their theology to account and let themselves off the hook, explaining away why God did not prove himself faithful in their life because God really wanted them to be in captivity. Do you see how, how twisted that becomes? And you have to make up your mind how you're going to respond to that and what your, what your perspective is going to be. In the midst of this, it's very interesting that you don't see Hezekiah come to the wall to answer Rabshakeh. He sent his servants, because we know from previous studies that Hezekiah was sick and in fact was dying at the time of this attack on Jerusalem. Now God gave him reprieve and he had 15 more years, but that hasn't happened yet. See, the enemy is not going to attack you at an opportune time. He will come at you when you're weak tired and sick. He will wait till you're discouraged. There's two, there's two times in your life that the enemy is going to come at you. One of them is in abject defeat and the other, the other one is in the aftermath of utmost victory. Mm -hmm. Kitty and I have learned that when we have a conference and God showed up, and a tremendous thing happens, and miracles were made manifest, but we are very conservative coming out of a conference like that about what we do next. We usually spend a week just pulling back, getting quiet before the Lord, because we know that that's going to be a time that the enemy is going to rise up and try and tear us down and assault us and attack us. And we've, we've learned that by experience. We've learned going into a battle. Mm -hmm. We've learned before we go into conferences, before we go into meetings, we don't do a lot of answering our phones. We don't, we're not checking our text messages every five minutes. We're not reading emails because we want to get focused because you ever get an email from the devil? You ever get a tweet from the devil, a text from the devil, a phone call from the devil? They'll usually come right when you're supposed to be very, very focused. And, uh, but right when uh, uh, the enemy will wait until you're discouraged and already struggling to assault your life, 
for a final victory. And you have to understand there is a point that ignoring Rabshakeh is not an option. The army had surrounded Jerusalem. Something had to be done. The mockery of Sennacherib and his servant Rabshakeh had to be answered. And likewise, there will be times that you'll be assaulted, challenged, and mocked. And pretending there isn't a problem will not be an option. <laughs> and let's go on and read what else Rabshakeh had to say. Verse 10 through the end of the chapter. Okay. And am I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? Um, the Lord said unto me, go up against this land and destroy it. So he's saying, God is with me. God told me to come plow you under. God told me, I love you, but. <laughs> there it is, the big but. <laughs> Verse 11. Then said Eliakim and Shibna and Joah unto Rabshakeh, Speak, I pray thee, unto thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it. And speak not to us in the Jews' language, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. But Rabshakeh said, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own pee with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, <laughs> Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for... He shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah. For thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and eat ye every one of his vine, and every one his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his own cistern. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware, lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Orphad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? And have they delivered Samaria out of my hands? They're brothers. So here we really get, what about your mama? Are you saying you've got more faith than your mama? He didn't deliver your daddy. What about your brother? Your brother, the Samaritans, they, they were plowed under by, who do you think you are? You're more spiritual than they are? Boy, he's cutting right to the quick. <laughs> Verse 20, who are they among the gods of all these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But they held their peace, and they answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was, saying, Answer him not. Then came Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, that was over the household, and Shibna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder of Hezekiah, with their, clo with their clothes rent, and told him the words of Rabshakeh. And notice when they got through listening to all this drivel, <laughs> that they came back to report to the king, but notice that they didn't say one word back to Rabshakeh. It said, answer him not. Charles Capps said, sometimes the most powerful faith statement you can make is saying nothing at all. Mm -hmm. Just because somebody comes up and makes a demand or challenges you or wants to get into an argument with you or wants to distract you doesn't mean you have to get involved. Learn to not respond like the scripture says, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a fiery trial, particularly where relationships are concerned, ask yourself if you're the one putting the wood on the fire. Because you have to learn to be quiet. You have to learn not to answer. It's like my wife talks about sometimes you get in a situation where there's a confrontation and things are said and God tells you what to say and then the next one that talks loses. There's times you just have to sit there and just look at them and hold your peace. You don't have to answer that text. You don't have to answer that instant message. You don't have to post that on social media. You don't have to respond to that email. You don't have to answer that, uh, that uh, cell phone call coming in. So, but people are like a moth through the flame and you bring about your own destruction because you are throwing gasoline on a fire. You're crying out to God, we'll go out. 
but you're contributing to the problem because you don't know how to be quiet. There's a place in the scripture that says silence waits for thee, O God. Oh, I'm waiting on God. You know, and we we're just mouthing off, screaming, crying, whining, complaining. And no, we're not waiting on God. Silence waits for God. Mm -hmm. See, Rabshakeh continues to speak for Sennacherib, and he says that trusting in the Hebrew God is folly because he claims the Hebrew God has commanded his master to besiege Jerusalem and to destroy it. Now, where did he get that idea? because Sennacherib had been listening to Isaiah's prophecy, because Isaiah has been prophesying for 35 chapters that God's going to whistle for the Assyrians, and he's going to bring the Assyrians to plow under the idolatrous southern kingdom and the idolatrous northern kingdom. So here is Sennacherib listening to the prophecies of of Isaiah when all of Jerusalem and Judah had been ignoring him like he was a raving half-naked prophet. Make no mistake, when you get a prophetic word from an anointed prophet, that is a prelude to war. Why? Because the enemy is listening to that prophetic word just like you're supposed to be. Amen. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.8 to war a good warfare with the prophecy spoken over him. Can you imagine the apostle Paul prophesying over Timothy? I bet Timothy never had another problem his whole life. No. He got a prophecy from the Apostle Paul, and the more accurate, the more anointed, the more timely the prophetic word, the deeper, the more, prof the more profound the warfare is going to be in the aftermath of that word. So Paul prophesies to Timothy, and then his, um, his conclusion is, Timothy, buckle up. Mm -hmm. See, prophecy many times is a... Um, is a defining of the exact opposite that you're going to be confronted with right. uh, in the near future after the word comes. Now, lukewarm teachers suggest to us, put the word on the shelf of unbelief in our lives and just wait to see what happened. Well, that isn't what the enemy does. Mm -mm. Remember that Assyria is the type of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist will be listening to those prophetic words, and guess what? He's going to be warring over your prophecies. He's going to take your prophetic words and bring war into your life. So you better be picking up that prophetic word. Better not to receive a prophetic word if you're going to ignore it, marginalize it, or sit back and take it as something, well, we're just going to wait and see what God does. No, the prophetic is about an assignment. The prophetic is about galvanizing you in your destiny, to move out into your destiny according to your capacity to obey, doing something with that word that 1 Timothy 1.18 defines as warring with your prophecy. Amen. Rabshakeh also spoke in the language of the common people. Isn't that interesting? The servants of Hezekiah, they tried to stop him, but he refused and he spoke even louder in very vulgar terms, describing the suffering that was planned for the people. See, when the enemy assaults your life, be sure he will send somebody who speaks your language and knows your personal history. Why, you know what happened to you five years ago when you tried to crawl out from under that situation? You're in, it didn't work out very well. It's going to be the same thing again. He knows how to push your buttons and convince you in very familiar terms that there is no hope of things ever getting better. And they'll point to other people, and Rabshak appointed to other nations that had fallen. And he's going to, in effect, say to you, who do you think you are? And are you thinking you're any better than your neighbors who suffered just as well? That's why people completely misunderstand the message of Hebrews 11, the roll call of the faithful. But what they don't pay attention to is that Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. What about those people who believed in God and didn't receive their answer? See, Hebrews 11 concludes with these all having obtained a good report, receive not the promise. So sometimes people have faith to endure not having received their deliverance, which is very good. People need to love God even if you're walking in failure. If you're walking in failure, your marriage is a train wreck, your finances are falling apart, you've got serious health problems, and uh, the job is in jeopardy, 
You need to learn in the midst of that situation to endure and to love God, to not shake your fist in God's face, to refuse to do like Job's wife, curse God and die. Mm -hmm. You need to learn to stay in love with Jesus in the midst of every situation. And these people, having obtained the good report, not receiving the promise, but maintaining their faith and their fidelity in God. See, sometimes people have faith to endure, though not having received their deliverance. Never mock or denigrate those who have suffered yet stayed faithful to God. However, do not let those people and their circumstance tempt you into not believing for something better. Amen. Let me say that to you again. See, sometimes we have deified the failure of others to receive. Mama died of cancer. Your next door neighbor died an excruciating death. Her 16-year-old boy died in a car accident and all this. And they're reading all of this theology into it and how God was really all up into all that. Mm -hmm. No, you have to realize that it's good if those people are staying faithful to God and not shaking their fist in God's face in the midst of that. But notice what verse 40 says. See, verse 39 says, it's a good report when they keep loving God even though they didn't obtain the promise. But notice what verse 40 says, but God having provided some better thing for us. There's something better than staying in love with Jesus while you're being put through the meat grinder of circumstance. That's a good thing to stay faithful to God, to endure in the midst of difficulty. But here's something better that they without us should not be made perfect. See, our purpose is not to let the patient suffering of others be our example. Because Hebrews 12 goes on to say, he didn't say now you follow their faith. And when you're being put through the meat grinder, you stay faithful. Well, yes, you should. But notice what it goes on to say. It says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, just right down the line, he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, mm -hmm. laying aside the weight of somebody else's testimony who didn't receive the deliverance. So you lay aside the weight and the sin. So the person may not be in sin who didn't receive their deliverance, but their testimony is a weight. Mm -hmm. My goodness, Joni Erickson Tata. She didn't get healed of her of her quadriplegia. And she's turned that into a worldwide ministry and probably done more for Jesus than I'll do in my lifetime. However, her testimony is a weight against the better thing. She did not receive her deliverance and nobody could construe under anybody's uh, a metric of measuring her testimony to say she received her deliverance because she did not. She's got the wheelchair to prove it. But notice what verse 40 says. Oh, Brother Walden, that makes me uncomfortable. Well, where does your fidelity lie? To what the word of God says or to somebody else's testimony? When somebody does not receive deliverance in the midst of, of doing their best to believe in God, but not being receiving their deliverance, that is a weight. Their testimony is a weight against those in similar circumstances who are purposing to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith, and have a different outcome. And we really need to get a hold of that, lest when it comes, we get plowed under because we weren't prepared to fight that battle. That's right. Laying aside the weight of somebody else's testimony who did not receive deliverance. And laying aside the sin, because that's the other thing you got to look at. Because it's a fact. It's amazing to me. People say, well, they didn't receive their healing. And so many times in the scripture, it's defined saying it's because they were in sin, because they were in unbelief. But yet today in modern Christianity, you would find it would be rare the instance of anyone saying or saying of, in their own circumstance or somebody else's, they didn't get their uh, answer because they were in sin. I mean, that's just the utter most, most rare, unusual, seldom mentioned mm -hmm. example. But there's two things. The weight of somebody else's lesser testimony can keep you from running your race and sin in your own life. Oh, don't that's you right. be, don't you be telling me I'm in sin. Man, we live in a narcissistic society of the younger generation you talk to the younger generation about the word sin, they don't even have a definition for that because they've been taught that everything they want, everything they do, and everything they think is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. But sin is a reality. 
Sin is something that is real and it needs to be defined. And maybe you go, you go tell me I'm in sin. Let me talk about your life. Let me point a finger at your life. That's right. We live in a day when it's very rare, if at all, that a, even a devout Christian is going to let another Christian of any stature to correct them. And the Bible talks about that. It's heaping to ourselves teachers, having itching ears, but knowing nothing about authority. So if we cannot allow someone else to correct us, then can I urge you to be self-correcting? I mean, it's almost like if we can't get a touchdown, then let's at least go for the field goal. Let's get some points, whatever we got to do. And if you can't allow somebody else to correct you, then purpose in your heart to be self-correcting because the Lord knows you need it. And so do I. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the sin temptation to unbelief. Let's lay aside the weight of somebody else's testimony that didn't have to do with sin, but they didn't receive the promise. Let's lay aside, let's be honest enough to look at our own life and see where we're falling short and run with patience, calm endurance without complaint, because Kitty says God don't like no whiny babies. The race that is set before us, knowing that everyone will not win, but we all have the opportunity to break the tape and see deliverance when we're looking to Jesus and not any other lesser example of endurance and fidelity toward God. Who's with me? Father, thank you for your word today in Isaiah 36. Every scripture is profitable for us if we'll just look and listen and learn. Thank you for teaching us as we go. Thank you that we're uh, working toward the goal of growing up into Christ, the full stature of Christ. Thank you for helping us along the way. And we bless you and we bless our family today in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.